Hello, everybody. Welcome to this evening's very, very important Glenbard Parent Series program. This is the 27th, 26th year of the Glenbard Parent Series. This is a topic that we have covered many, many times, and we will cover this topic again. We are so excited that you are here. We're excited to have our experts here tonight for Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month, the month of September. We have had four programs dealing with this topic. And just because it's this, this topic will be covered several times throughout the year uh, in a range of topics that we cover, trying to bring to you information about the challenges of parenting today. Tonight, you will hear from Ross Zabo. You will hear from Dr. Jason Washburn. You will hear from Janet Cook. Janet Cook, her remarks, Janet is the Assistant Superintendent for Student Services at Glenbard. She'll have some remarks at eight o'clock following this evening's program. Uh, as you know, everyone is always welcome to the programming for the Glenbard Parent Series. Our homework for all of you is to please look, see what's ahead, find the programs that are of interest to you, and then tweet and retreat and share the resource so that we can bring even more people to these important conversations. You saw the slide of all of our sponsors. They're listed here, our annual sponsors. And if you go to glenbargps.org and look at the brochure, you'll see all the additional sponsors and the folks that really help us uh, bring this to you tonight. Um, the format, once again, um, will be these three speakers. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And now let's begin. Our speaker, our first speaker tonight is Ross Zabo. He is the wellness director for the Geffen Institute and Academy at UCLA and CEO of the Human Power Project, a company that creates cutting edge mental health curriculum. He's an award-winning speaker, author, and teacher. He was the director of the National Mental Health Awareness Campaign for eight years. In that time, he spoke to over 1 million people and wrote a book titled Behind Happy Faces. After eight years on the road, he burned out and so did what anyone would do when they're exhausted, he joined the Peace Corps. He served in Botswana for two years and when he came home, he decided to start his own company to create mental health curriculum for people of all ages. His first curriculum also titled Behind Happy Faces is being used by over 200,000 students across the world. He's the author of a kid's book about anxiety and the host of a kid's class about mental health, a kid's book about anxiety. He was named, which was named one of Oprah's favorite things in 2020. Jason Washburn, PhD, is a research consultant with Lurie Children's Hospital. And he's a professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, where he's the director for graduate studies for the master's and PhD program in clinical psychology. He has over 20 years of experience as a board certified clinical child psychologist, working with children, families, and caregivers in schools, communities, and hospital settings. He's focused on translating research into practice through implementation of effective psychological interventions with children and adolescents. He consults with major hospital institutions like Amida, we thank them, uh, and Alexian Brothers Behavioral Health Hospital. Again, following remarks of these two gentlemen, we'll hear from Janet Cook. And now, Ross, please take it away. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here, everybody. So one of the biggest challenges I have, and one of the biggest challenges that all mental health advocates have, is as soon as we say the words mental health, a lot of people have different ideas of what that means. When you Google image mental health, these are the images that tend to come up. The actual definition of mental health is not having a problem. The actual definition of mental health is how you address challenges in your life. Mental health is as important as physical health. Take care of yourself. Take care of your mental health. Do what you can to balance your own life because the most devastating thing is watching your kids go through pain. But these disorders don't always work the way we want them to. And much like the oxygen mask on a plane, it's good for you to take care of yourself. I gave my parents a lot of reasons to not think that I would live to be 21, but I did. I can't tell you how many hands I've held, how many people I've hugged, how many tears I've seen from friends and family members who had a young person who didn't live to be 21. I lost my own cousin a couple of years ago to an opiate overdose. You only have one chance and this is it. 
And most of us spend our days going through a checklist of things we have to do. And at the end of that checklist, we all go to our own place of comfort, our own place of peace. For some of you, that place of comfort is a room. For some of you, that place of comfort is a person. For some of you, it's a song or a phone. The next time you're in your place of comfort, I really want you to think about what you can do to express your internal life more. What you model as a parent makes a big difference. Even when your kids aren't following you, what you model, what you share, how you talk about mental health, how you show that you are taking care of your mental health, how you show love and care for your family, it makes a huge difference. It takes more strength to talk about these issues than it does to hide them. It takes more strength to uncover these issues than it does to bury them. All of you watching this tonight have the strength to change your mental health. I share with you my personal story, but what I really hope happens after this is at some point in your life, when it really matters the most, you find the strength to share your story because you have no idea where your story will take you until you tell it. Thank you very much. I know that there is a question. A question from McKenna. McKenna? Hello, my name is McKenna and I am a senior at Glenbard North High School. How would friends of teenagers help their depression? Just help a friend who's suffering. Yeah, thanks so much for that question, McKenna. It's really important. And there are, are a couple of things to keep in mind. The first thing to keep in mind is like, a lot of times when you approach a person about their mental health, they do get defensive. So anything you can do to help them feel more comfortable. So whatever you can do to help them be less defensive, letting them know you care about them, comparing mental health to physical health, letting, reminding them that they would check in on you, so, things like that, that help them feel comfortable. The next step in that is then asking open-ended questions to try and find out really what is going on. So, you know, how are you? Tell me about what's going on. You used to act this way, now you're acting this way. What's happening in your life? And as you ask those open-ended questions, um, you can learn more about what that person might need. Some people might say like, hey, I just need to vent. Some people might say like, hey, I need your help with this thing. Some people might say, hey, I need boundaries around this. In the scenario where someone uh, is talking about what's going on, you see their situation getting worse and they're not seeking help, then you do have to en engage someone else. Talk to a parent, talk to an adult, talk to a counselor, call 1-800-273-TALK, uh, the Suicide Prevention and lifeline. The most important thing you can remember is that you're not a psychologist or a therapist. If you were walking with your friend and they fell and broke their leg, you wouldn't be like, stay here and then go to like a pharmacy and get cast things and come back and put a cast on their leg. You know that if someone fell and broke their leg, you'd call 911. One of the most dangerous situations that teens get into is they become their friend's therapist and they enter into a place where they're trying to provide help or treatment that they can't provide. Sometimes your friend's leg is broken. Sometimes it needs help. Sometimes their mental health is broken and they need help. And the last thing is, if someone's depression turns into suicidal ideation or suicide thoughts, like you need to ask someone if they have a plan. And if they have a plan, you can take all the steps I just mentioned and throw them out the window. Because once someone has a plan, the next step is to carry it out. That's when you need to tell an adult, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or do something direct to really intervene and, and help them out. Thank you so much, Russ. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jason Washburn, you are up. Great. Thanks so much, Gilda. And thank you, Ross, for uh, sharing your story with us and sharing all of your, uh, 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 all that you've done with all of that. And it really has shown um, what we can do when we get the help that we need and make the changes that we need to make um, to support our mental health just as we support our physical health. So I really appreciate that message. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Again, my name is uh, Jason Washburn uh, and I am a uh, clinical psychologist at uh, Northwestern University and I work within Northwestern Medicine. Um, and so I'm gonna talk today about preventing suicide and what we can do, um, particularly as parents uh, you know, and, and friends to help each other uh, when somebody is at the point where they're thinking about taking their own life. Um, so let me get my slide up here. I wanna start with kind of where things are um, as it relates to mental health. And, and Ross talked a little bit about some statistics and where things are at. And what I wanna do is just identify our trend in this country. 
we're not in a very good trend. And that's what this is showing. Uh, this is a study that's done every couple of years by the National Youth uh, Risk Behavior Survey. Um, and it, it has tracked some of these very simple questions over many years. And you can see from 2009 to 2019, 2019 being the last year that they had these data. Um, and you can see some pretty concerning trends, uh, pretty significant worsening across. And these are, these are high school students, general population high school students. Um, and these are percentages. Uh, so up to a third over a third uh, in 2019, feeling sad and hopeless, um, uh, close to 20% uh, seriously considering attempting suicide. Um, and, you know, strong increases over the last uh, 10 years in that, uh, making a plan for suicide. You know, as Ross said, that's where you, you get really concerned. You know, 16% actually attempting suicide up to 9%. Uh, these are all in the last year. Um, and injured to the point of, of needing to be treated after a suicide attempt, increasing to 2.5%. Um, these are really concerning statistics, and they show that our, our mental health uh, among youth is worsening. Um, and so this, this is a very sober slide for me, and something that really makes me take a pause and think that we need to do more. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate, again, the message that uh, Ross provided all of the work that Guild is doing around this because you know we are in a very precarious position as we think about how our mental health has been progressing over the last decade. And the worst part is all of this is is before COVID. Um, we know that the impact of COVID has has been difficult for a lot of our youth, uh, both young children and uh, older children and adults. Uh, we've seen a lot of impacts. And, and that makes sense, right? When we look at um, all the factors that are, are, are increasing risk for poor mental health among um, the population, you know, we've all experienced COVID. We've all experienced, you know, some aspect of the risk factors um, uh, for mental uh, illness and mental disorder over the last uh, uh, year and a half. Um, so it's not a surprise that some of the data that's coming out, some of it here from Lurie Children's, is showing this increased risk. You know, almost half of parents indicating concerns with their with their pediatrician for their child's mental health. Um, you know, nearly a quarter saying that they've used mental or behavioral health services in the last six to twelve months. Um, and 18% saying that they could not get the services that they needed. Um, and this is, this is fairly recent data coming out um, from Voices, uh, which is a, a part of Lurie Children's. Um, some, of the old, uh, some of our own work um, uh, that I've uh, published uh, along with Tali Raviv and, and others within the Center for Childhood Resilience has shown that the more COVID exposure people have had, the the worse um, that parents are rating their children. Um, so more angry, more anxious, more depressed, more lonely, um, you know, to some degree, uh, slight increases, although not significant in self-harm or suicide, and then also, you know, increased stress. And even more concerning than that, some of the, the, the encouraging positive um, uh, traits that we would expect in our, our kids to help offset uh, mental health concerns have gone down um, as COVID exposure increases. So, you know, the, the more likely that you have had COVID scares, someone in your family with COVID, somebody who's died from COVID, all those kind of things, we see a decrease in social peer relationships, hopefulness, interacting positively, uh, relaxing, all those kind of things have also gotten worse. Um, so we are concerned. And when we look directly at suicide, we see some, some data around this that, that make it even more concerning. Uh, this is a recent study in the, in the um, Journal of Pediatrics showing uh, that kids who get screened for depression, um, we've seen some, some increases in that, particularly as, as school started up during the, the COVID period um, between September and December of 2020. Um, so we've seen you know, screening for suicide risk increasing at rates that are significant and concerning. Even more so than that, um, we've seen increases in suicide attempts, uh, particularly among girls. We've seen some really significant and concerning increases 
Um, and these data, which also just came out uh, from the CDC, ages 12 to 17, we're seeing girls, um, adolescent girls, uh, showing even greater increases, even, even up to a 50, over a 50% increase in the current year, in 2021, um, we're seeing these increases. Uh, and so this persistence of COVID is certainly taking its toll on us. So it's all the more reason that we need to step up our suicide prevention efforts. And we need to do more to intervene directly in those who are at high risk and those who are struggling. Um, so what I wanna share with you is, is how do we understand that? How do we understand who is struggling or who might be experiencing some concerns? These are what I refer to as early warning signs. These are just general factors to pay attention to. What I want to be clear about is, is one of these factors in isolation doesn't mean that your child or your friend is, is at risk for suicide, but could it increase concerns in that area? Sure, um, particularly when you start to see several of those concerns coming together. Um, so things like withdrawing from friends or family, um, having difficulties in school that you weren't having before, seeing declines in, in the quality of your work, um, significant changes in your eating habits or sleeping habits, um, changes in personality or mood. Um, obviously, if someone's increasingly depressed, um, increasingly negativistic, um, you know, increasingly self-deprecatory, really being down on themselves, um, having some of that, that self-hatred that Ross was talking about um, and expressing some of that. Uh, having difficulty enjoying things that they used to enjoy, um, difficulty concentrating different than usual. So I'm not talking about somebody who's always had difficulty concentrating, but it's getting harder and harder for them to do it. Um, being bored all the time, again, mixed with that, like, I used to enjoy this, I don't enjoy it anymore, everything's boring to me. A loss of interest in things one used to care about, um, as well as the more obvious signs, preoccupation with death, uh, talking about um, death a lot, um, you know, having a lot of uh, physical symptoms that, that aren't explained by other things. So again, one of these in isolation doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is at risk for suicide and we don't want to jump to that. What it does mean is that something's going on. We need to understand then what might be going on. Now, the more obvious, what I refer to as late warning signs, when there might be uh, more of an imminent risk is when people talk directly about death and hurting themselves or self-harm, um, uh, you know, cutting themselves, those things like that, uh, particularly when somebody tells you directly that they have a plan to hurt themselves. As, as Ross said earlier, you know, that's a sign that things are very, very serious. Um, but it can be other things as well. So things such as, um, you know, exhibiting impulsivity, uh, being more reactive, more violent, more rebellious, uh, you know, running away more. Um, people who don't want your help, just leave me alone. I, I, I'm beyond help. I, uh, it's too late for me. Those kind of statements. Uh, when kids start really complaining and talking about how awful they are inside, that, that sense of self, self-hatred that, that may have been more of kind of a loose thing before, suddenly solidifying to, you know, I'm just an awful person. I, I am just horrible. You know, that sense of self-hatred is a real indicator that somebody is at the point where they just don't care anymore. As Ross said, they might engage in those behaviors that maybe they're not directly trying to kill themselves, but they also don't care if they do die, right? That can then progress into more of wanting to die. Um, and certainly making statements of hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, like why bother, why try? So again, these are some warning signs of something maybe more imminent that, that you might want to take action immediately. Um, some other, other types of things that you might see, you know, giving praise, giving some rewards, and not really caring about that, kind of just losing interest in any of those things. Um, giving away favorite possessions is a big concern of mine. Um, again, not caring whether they have things in their life because they're not gonna need it because they've made a plan. They're, they're going to not be here anymore. So might as well give away my Xbox. Uh, writing a note, making a will, very obvious signs there. Um, saying it directly, communicating it directly or giving hints with the statements that they're making. 
And one that often confuses people is when somebody who has been, you know, distressed and struggling for a long time suddenly becomes fine. Suddenly they're, they're at some level of peace or they're even cheerful. Uh, when it comes on sudden like that, you have to wonder what's going on. And what sometimes is going on is that they've made a decision. They've decided that, you know, I, I don't want to live anymore. Um, and there's a level of peace that can come with that for some people. Um, and that, again, is a very concerning sign that they've made a decision and they might act soon. So when you see some of these late warning signs, it's important to ask, even with some of the early warning signs, it's important to check in on them. Uh, I saw earlier in, in, in the chat, you know, just asking, how are you? Um, that's a really important question. And I would say, particularly for those early warning signs, checking in, how are you? What's going on? You know, I, I see this or this, you know, how, how are you doing? Engaging in that kind of open discussion of, you know, I'm concerned about you, or even more so than I'm concerned about you, I care about you, right? And I want you to know that I care about you. And so I'm here for you, let me know. If, however, you're seeing some of those late warning signs, it's time to ask directly about suicide. So how do you ask about it? And, you know, before I get into this, let me just say a lot of, a lot of parents, a lot of, you know, friends, they get worried about this. They think, if I ask about this, I'm going to plant it in their head. I'm going to give them the idea. I will tell you, in all the years that I have been a, a clinical psychologist, um, and all of my years of living, I have never seen anybody who didn't have thoughts of suicide that suddenly goes, you know what? I wasn't thinking of it. Now that you mention it, that just doesn't happen. Now, certainly, kids can inform each other about these things. Kids can encourage these things in, in worst case scenario, uh, but we don't plant it. When a caring adult goes and asks a child in need how they're doing and asks about if they're thinking about ending their life, that does not plant anything except that you care about. And so asking about suicide, particularly when you're really concerned about it, is an extremely important and useful way to keep somebody alive. All the, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm an academic, I'm also a clinician. All the research in the world has shown that it only helps, right? There's not one piece of data out there that I have ever seen that suggests it plants the idea. So please do it, and as a clinician, I know that it can save lives. So if you're concerned, ask, but do so privately, right? Don't call somebody out um, and don't just jump right into it, right? Start with some open-ending, non-threatening questions. Get them to kind of talk about what's stressing them out lately, how things are going. And this is particularly helpful if this is a, you know, kind of conversation that you started earlier, right? With some of those early warnings. Um, a lot of times, when, you know, particularly when I when I have somebody who's not wanting to talk to me, I'll I'll say, you know, how how bad are your parents upsetting you lately, right? Um, or if I'm the parent, I might say, how much have I been upsetting you lately? How much have I been pissing you off lately? How much have I been irritating you, right? And so starting to get them talking, and then I ask directly about how they're feeling because that's ultimately what's behind this. And sometimes I normalize this as, as Ross was doing throughout his entire conversation. You know, we all get sick sometimes. We all break a leg, not all of us, but sometimes we break a leg, we hurt something. I, I cast on my hand right now. And we all sometimes feel sad. We feel angry, feel irritable. Sometimes that gets to a point where it feels really bad. So we want to normalize that. Ask how they're doing, ask how their emotions are. And then you need to get to a point where you actually ask them directly. And you can say it in many different ways. Have you thought about actually hurting yourself? You know, have you ever thought about just ending it all? Have you ever wished you could fall asleep and never wake up? And asking it directly, have you ever thought about actually killing yourself? So you want to ask directly about it. And you want to communicate that you understand their pain, right? And that you're not afraid of this because you're going to be there for them and you're going to help them. Now, if they say yes, the first thing to do is remain calm. Okay, you don't want that to freak you out. You don't want that to have a negative reaction for them. 
And then you use empathy. You express in your voice tone, in your face, that you understand and acknowledge how bad things must be right now. They're deep despair, okay? And then you quickly move to providing them reassurance. I hear you. I hear how upset you are, and we're gonna get you help. And at that point, you immediately get them in for an evaluation. You get help immediately, whether that's calling 911, whether that's reaching out to your, your school mental health um, a team, uh, whether that is reaching out to the therapist or psychiatrist or whoever might be involved, you get them help. Now, what if you ask this and they don't say anything, right? They, they deny it all. You continue to show that you love them and you care for them, right? You provide empathy, you validate their feelings, okay? You look for and you prioritize the positive without invalidating how they're feeling. Okay, so try to be positive, but also try to validate and, and understand their experience because their experience isn't always going to be positive. And then you continue to monitor, monitor for signs. You continue to look for those late warning signs. And if they don't already have services, get them hooked up with services. Okay, but don't give up. You never, ever give up. So getting help is important. And one thing that, that this, this awful pandemic has taught us is that there's multiple ways to get help. We can get help in person now. We can also get help remotely. Um, Ross mentioned the suicide hotlines, the text lines, the chat lines. All of those things are increasing in terms of their availability. Um, they are there. Use them. Find out what's best for yourself, what's best for your child, what's best for your friend. Okay. Seek out and get help. Help actually works. We have treatments that are effective. We have treatments that can help. but you have to access them for them to actually help. So with that, I'm going to stop and just say thank you and thank you all for the privilege of being here tonight. Um, thank to Ross, thank to Gilda, and I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns that anybody might have. Jason, thank you once again. Whenever you come, I, my, my wrist hurts from the note-taking that I that I'm access. Arian, do you have a question? Hello, I'm Arian Sandoval. I'm a senior at Gilmart South High School, and I just have one question. And my question is, what makes teens vulnerable to suicide? So yeah, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Arian. I, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, what we know is that for you know almost all people who who actually die from suicide, that there is an underlying mental health condition, and so one of the things that make people susceptible to thoughts of suicide are mental health conditions. And those could be multiple types of conditions. They can be, um, you know, the, the classic one that everybody thinks of, which is depression. Uh, but as, as Ross gave testimony to tonight, um, bipolar disorder can, can lead to that as well. Um, in fact, you know, manic episodes are, are a time where I get particularly concerned about somebody uh, particularly when they're having what we call a mixed episode, where there's a combination of both depression and manic symptoms. Um, eating disorders, uh, substance use disorders, um, antisocial behaviors at times. There's a lot of mental health problems that increase risk for suicide. And so we want to pay attention to mental health, build mental health, just like physical health. I really love that um, uh, approach that Ross took, because that is so very true. Um, you know, it's, it's not true that somebody will just out of the blue commit suicide. There's almost always a intervening mental disorder. So if we can address that mental disorder, right, if we can actively work on that, we can help to manage suicide risk. We can help to lower suicide risk. Um, and that's ultimately the best thing that we can do. So that is the, one of the main things that makes people susceptible. Um, you know, there are some what we'd refer to as contagions around suicide. What that means is that sometimes when you know one friend is feeling suicidal, another friend might then start to feel suicidal. So we do see that occurring. Again, that's going to occur among youth that are already vulnerable because of mental health condition. Um, we often see also with social media that these things can, can take on um, uh, you know, a whole nother element. And so we want to be careful about how we're using social media. We want to be careful about um, making sure that our peer groups are as supportive and, and uh, mental health positive as possible. 
And this is where I think schools have a lot of capability because having things like mental health clubs um, that can really help to normalize mental health, support mental health. Um, mental health is not depression. Mental health is working on um, uh, staying mentally healthy, dealing actively with stress, coping with difficulties and the everyday ups and downs that we all experience. So really having those pro-mental health clubs um, that can really help to um, uh, uh, keep everybody at the top of their game, mentally speaking, and also normalize when somebody is not at the top of their game so that they can then seek help and help each other to get help. It's kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope that helps. Thank you. Jason, we were talking just a minute ago, you and I, about how um, important it is to understand that in this time of COVID, that, that there will be times of sadness and how important it is to help our kids express their emotions um, and then, of course, be the listener and, and take that. Would you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that, that um, so, you know, at Northwestern Medicine, I, I work both on an outpatient basis as well as on our inpatient basis. And, and so I see varying levels at, at which, which people are suffering. Um, and one of the things that, that I see a lot of, um, you know, particularly when people talk about their childhood is this sense of, of validation or invalidation. And I think that is such a critical thing for us to do as parents. When, when somebody is experiencing an emotion, <laughs> I, I know through my own parenting that if that emotion is, is grating on me or irritating me, um, or if I think that they're being too dramatic, I'm very likely to say, Oh, oh, no, you don't, you know, you're fine, right? And, and there's a level of kind of normalcy to that uh, as parents. Um, but I want to challenge us all to instead, you know, both as parents and as friends, you know, speaking of, of peers, I want us all to validate that instead. When somebody's feeling an emotion, they're feeling that emotion. We want to acknowledge that. We want to respect that. We want to say, you know, I hear you. I see what you're going through. I may not experience what you're going through at the same level that you do. You're experiencing it in your own way, but I, I understand it. I, I, I understand that you are feeling that. Okay. I hear you. And that's a really important thing to do. We all, you know, when you, when you think of mental health, mental health is an experience that we all have, right? We all feel happy at times. We all feel sad at times. We all feel anxious at times. Um, we all experience this. It's all in a continuum. And so it's important for us, you know, as, as, as human beings to acknowledge that in each other um, when people are going through tough times and to not disregard it, to not shove it to the side. As parents, we all just want to say, you're fine, okay? You're struggling right now. You're feeling sad. You're feeling anxious. And you are going to be fine. That's one way to look at it, okay? I'm here to help you to get to be fine. But right now, I understand you might not be fine. Right now, I understand you might not be okay. And that's okay that you're not okay, right? I can handle that. I can listen to that. I can, if you want, help you with that, right? And as Ross said, not to be your kid's therapist, not to be your friend's therapist. That's what therapists are for. That's what psychologists are for. Um, but to be there, to listen, to support, to do what you can do, right? And to know when it's time to say, you know what, that's, that's a little too much for me. I need some help in, in how to deal with that. Would you be okay if I reach out to someone to see what we can do to get help? But that validation is of the emotion. You don't have to fix the emotion, right? Just acknowledging it, respecting it is a great place to start. This next question comes in on around social media. Should it be limited? Oh, how many hours do we have? Um, so look, social media is great for many things and we know our kids are gonna use it. Um, the question is how do you use it and when do you use it? And, and so, you know, if social media is a positive thing, and, it, and it's really helping kids to feel connected, especially in this age where being connected is very hard in person, right? There's a lot of positives to that. 
Um, but social media can take on you know, a life of its own. And, you know, it can be something that, you know, can become all consuming to some kids. And um, it can certainly become a, uh, you know, an area for cyberbullying um, and, you know, for lots of distress. And so it's, it's a tool. And we have to look at it as a tool and see how it is helping us and how it is hurting us. At times, that tool um, can be too much. And at times, that tool can maybe not be used enough, right? So just not letting your kid participate in you know, an online world can be a problem just as allowing your kid to do it nine, you know, or all, all parts of the day and all waking hours and getting in the way of sleep, right? Um, so we have to be careful about how it's used. And the best way to approach that is through a collaborative discussion about, you know, what are the pros? What are the cons of using social media? What are the, you know, what's it like for you? What are the things that are, are causing you strife around that? Um, really engaging in an open discussion about that and trying to work with your child as a partner around that. Um, coming to some agreed upon constraints. And by the way, if you're trying to constrain your child's social media by doing this, hey, hey, get off that phone. Hold on. You know, you've got to put your phone down. So I'm a huge fan of no phone zones within the house and no phone times. But if I'm not following that, there's no way I should expect my, my, my child to follow that. So, you know, Ross mentioned modeling. We have to model that as well, right? And so good tech use, good social media use, broadly speaking. We have to show that along with our child. And so, you know, if they're calling us on that, let's take a pause and be like, you know what, you're right. Let's do something together, right? But also acknowledging, again, the positives. We don't want to paint it all as negative. Uh, we want them to understand that we understand that it, it's, it's a part of life for a lot of kids, most kids, if not all kids, um, but, you know, adolescents in particular, and that we want to um, help them to do it in a healthy way. And if we can do that, while also maintaining some level of monitoring, you know, safe monitoring, respectful monitoring of their use, then I think we can make it work. Um, but I, I will tell you, it's touch and go at times. It's not an easy thing to do, and it's a constant management. Yeah. Uh, the last question before we say, before we hear from Janet, um, how do you help someone who refuses to get help? Yeah, well, that is so hard. Um, there's, there's a couple answers to that. If, if you're seeing late warning signs, then I think you need to take action, right? You need to reach out to somebody who can help. Um, there are times where, you know, I, I will call and, and bring in, you know, a mental health team, bring in 911 if I have to, um, you know, drive them to the emergency room, right? Um, there are times where you just need to get help for somebody who doesn't want to get help. And if they don't want to get help, that's where you need to take that next step. Um, and 911 would be that next step, you know, if all other options, you know, are being refused. Um, you know, we have to be careful of 911 in this day and age in terms of making sure that a mental health response is coming rather than just a police response. And so I want to acknowledge that. Um, there are police that are well-trained in dealing with mental health crises, uh, but we need more of that. We need a lot more of that. And, and frankly, we need mental health teams that are, are just starting to be piloted throughout the Chicagoland area. We need more of that. Um, and so, so hopefully that'll change over the next you know, five to 10 years that we'll have mental health responses to 911 calls. Um, so I want to acknowledge the complexities of that. Um, but there are times where that we have to take that when we see those late warning signs. Okay? Um, if somebody doesn't want help and you know, we're not at the late warning sign, a lot of times what I tell people is, I'm here for you. I want to keep checking in on you. I understand and respect where you're at right now, but I love you and I care for you. And I, I want to stay in touch with you and I want to do what I can for you, okay? Um, and that's the best we can do. And, you know, so telling somebody you need to get help and I'm going to hold my breath until you do, like that's not going to work. So a lot of times what I ask people to do is just engage in, in, in what we call pros and cons. What are the pros and cons of getting help, right? Mm -hmm. What's the worst that can happen if you get help? Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's the best that can happen if you get help? Mm -hmm. What's the worst that can happen if you don't get help? What's the best that can happen if you don't get help, mm -hmm. right? 
So helping them work through that and staying as much as possible a neutral party to that so that they know that they can bounce ideas off you, that they know that you are open, but they also know underneath all of that you love and you care. Jason, thank you so much. Such an important topic, so difficult to talk about, but I'm so grateful to everyone who came tonight. So grateful to you and to Ross. Thank you both so much. Janet, you have some concluding remarks for us? I do. Thank you so much, Kelda. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Jason. This evening was a great time to sit back and listen and hear from experts, hear people's stories. And I, I can't say enough that having the families and communities come together to hear the same message is extremely powerful when we think about the work the schools need to do to keep supporting students to be mentally healthy. The school district, Glenbard, is invested in supports for students to be mentally healthy, uh, for supports for students to cope with mental illness. And we've doing, been doing a lot of work lately. We're not done. We are on a path to make sure that we're always challenging ourselves to get better and better. This is an important area, and our kids are extremely important. We've been this year uh, stepping up and administering a curriculum that includes a survey about suicide awareness individually to students called Signs of Suicide in every health classroom. We're doing it this first semester, and we'll do it again next semester when health continues. Families are notified shortly before. And, and this, is, this is that important step to not only teach on the topic, but then to ask the key questions. Do you have um, an adult that is in your life? Are, are you thinking about suicide? All of those very, very important questions to reach our hands out and to show kids we care, to show kids that we are there for them. I'm excited to say we took that step because all of these conversations, while they're uncomfortable, quite honestly, they're the path to normalize conversations about mental health. And we are definitely owning that we need to take those steps. So. As far as Glenbard, the schools, the staff, we're all here to support kids. And we're delighted to see so many community and family members coming out to learn about the same topics. So thank you all for coming out this evening. Janet, thank you, I, know, I know you're, you have urgency around what COVID has brought and I wanna thank you for your work. And I know it continues and, and um, it's just, there's just too much at stake here to do anything but that. Again, I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you for all those who listened in. Um, parts of this will be available on our, uh, web, on our website at our YouTube channel. So go to glenbardgps.org and you will, on this page, you will find uh, Jason's comments, a recap of Ross's comments. Um, I just want to quickly make you aware of what's coming up. Um, the Glenbard Parent Series wants to bring you programming that will appeal to all parents. So next week, Wednesday, October 6th, we're bringing you Jeff Salingo, who has an important book called Who Gets In and Why. And I like this book a lot and his remarks because it really does try to calm some of the anxiety around a uh, college application process. And I think we'll all uh, spend another night learning that night. And then two very important programs on similar topics to tonight. Um, the Glenbard uh, faculty and staff will be hearing from Mark Brackett on October 12th. And I thank you, Janet, for your support for that. I think that's a really, really important conversation. Permission to feel, unlocking the power of emotions to help our kids, ourselves, and our society thrive. So uh, Dr. Brackett will be talking to Glenbard staff in the morning. And then at night, please come back on October 12th at 7 p.m. We've just added a program with Dr. Lori Santos. Uh, her course at Yale University is the most popular course in the history of that university. It's called The Science of Happiness, Psychology and the Good Life. This program is in partnership with some other school districts. It starts at 6 p.m. Go to Glenbar GPS for the link, which will be posted soon. Thank you all so much for your time. Let's go hug our kids. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone.